All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Brian Solston. He's an aerospace systems engineer, Bitcoiner since 2017, and he ran for U.S. Senate on a zero tax Bitcoin platform. He brings a unique perspective to the discourse on the conservation within a debt based monetary system and conservation within a commodity based monetary system. In his book, Apex Environmental Solution, Bitcoin, Brian argues that all conservation efforts within our current monetary system are futile and that we are driven into a hyper consumption behavior that does not improve our lives and our societies. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to talk with you today. So uh, welcome, Brian. Thank you, Bram. I, I appreciate you having me on your show. Yeah, I uh, you, you send me your book. It's 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 almost an encyclopedia. I would say it's it's huge and um, huge deep dive. I think is what uh, what I want to say. And I think it's really interesting in general. I don't know how you experience that, but uh, there's people from all different directions gravitating towards Bitcoin. And I think. Uh, you know, your approach with your background is, is very interesting. And so uh, I wanted to start with, you know, in your book, you discuss how, how Bitcoin addresses the flaws in the centralized money system that we have. What are these flaws and what does Bitcoin solve? Well, our current system, you know, the fiat monetary system is it's a centralizing function. And, uh, and why is that a centralizing function? I would say that, that that's really uh, discussed mostly in depth in what I call the, the, the spectrum tri trichotomy. Uh, you know, we really have three ways to look at it. And, and one way is usury, which is, you know, excessive interest rates. We have a natural interest rate. And what is that free market? And then we have on the other end of that spectrum, fiat which is artificially low interest rates. And who is the benefit of those artificially low interest rates? It's not everybody. It's, it's only a few. Uh, you could have called them too big to fail, but that's recently been renamed to the SIBs, you know, significantly important banks. And so this, <laughs> yeah. this, uh, this is a centralizing function is because they are the benefit of those artificially low interest rates. And since, other people cannot compete with them because they don't have access to those artificially low interest rates that that centralizes and and financializes the free market system. It say goodbye to it. It, it. it keeps ratcheting. It keeps the central centralizing function keeps on ratcheting and our free market uh, system or it's disappearing. I mean, it is no different than communism in the in the long run. Hmm. And so would you say we are at the end of this entire ladder almost, I would say, right? From money creation at the top to the, the, the plebs, the citizens using it at the bottom in what could be a free market. But you argue that, you know, because it's influenced from the top, there is no real free market I then. I, yeah, there is no free market as we continue to centralize, financialize the the, the you know the monetary system is is a centralizing function yeah. because of the artificially low interest rates and 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 that's the that's the spectrum tri trichotomy usury you know uh, the free market system which is a you know a, a natural interest rate and then fiat which is artificially low yeah. So what do you what what would you say is the most important com concept in in the simplest terms possible that everyone should understand? I think you know when we e eventually want to talk with people about Bitcoin, which we see as a solution, we first want them to see the problem. But I think as you as you also experience, it's hard for people to understand. You know it, what it, it's what it really is. hard. You know I I love to. Uh, let, me, let me just preface this. I've, I've been obsessed with Bitcoin since 2017. And lately, I've been able to, let's say, calm down a little bit. And I just enjoy having casual conversations with everyday people about Bitcoin. And they really don't understand these, these basic concepts. And let me get back to your question. I, I think the takeaway is, uh, if, if you look at a commodity-based monetary system, and would you restate your question again, Bram? Well, what's the most important concept people should understand? Like the, if, if there's one thing, what's the core of why the money that we use does not help us? 
I think we are no longer in a commodity-based monetary system. We, we are in a, a fiat system and there really is no escape because what do they do? You know, they just keep on rolling that debt and that centralizes capital. Capital continues to centralize. And so how do you escape that? You know, I mean, usually, you know, if you look at history, eventually it gets top heavy, the Soviet Union imploded. And, uh, and there's a real risk of war when, when things like that happen. So I, I think, I, I don't know if there is an absolute, uh, I, I do believe in the debt spiral, but does that mean that it ever really collapses? No, I, I think that it, it, we, can, we can take a ideal money approach and say, here's a revolution we're gonna change, or we can take an evolutionary approach where we have something like asymptotic ideal money, which is Bitcoin, um, and that will displace over time uh, as, as Bitcoin becomes, you know, its inflation rate increasingly moves towards zero uh, because the halvings go down every four, will we'll displace this bad money with good money. Yeah. And so when you talk about commodity-based money, I, I always translate that into, you know, a commodity is something for which work was done, whatever the commodity is, right? So I think gold in general is a, is a great example that's yeah. compressed energy from the earth into this shiny rock, right? So something happened to create the, the commodity is, is perhaps a simpler explanation that, you know, currently fiat money is created without any work, right? There is not nothing of energy that was used to to create this and therefore it doesn't it doesn't work when we trade our own energy you know in the value that we deliver um and we get rewarded with something that can that can be infinitely created yeah and and you know this this concept of a commodity based uh monetary system or you know natural interest rates i i i think it, it's you know i i ran on this platform. And by the way, uh, that was a long time ago, but, but when I ran uh, for Senate, the platform was, you know, zero tax Bitcoin. And really what we're talking about is zero tax commodity for, for a commodity based monetary system. And it's not just Bitcoin. I think all these commodities really are a way to uh, accelerate the, the efficiency of our economy by eliminating all these third parties. We, we just, so I think zero tax gold, silver, all of it, even mm -hmm. copper, uh, yeah. you know, and, and perhaps, you know, uh, you know, coffee is a commodity. It's one of the most traded, you know, maybe we should have that too, just to increase the velocity of value. So that's the key point is if we increase the velocity of value, we can't fully comprehend how exponentially our, our world becomes just more efficient. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature fold for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally. Only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet that's easy to use. With their mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source software and hardware. You can get $10 off a Foundation Passport with code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Isn't that, doesn't that uh, contradict what 
the Keynesians would argue is that, you know, the 2% inflation programmatically incentivizes people to, to spend the money. It, it does. And, you know, I was having a conversation on my porch with a, with a new neighbor and, and we were talking about inflation and he, you know, he thought it was good. Uh, and, and mm. it, it, it's such a fundamental understanding that, that inflation is theft and uh, our central bankers always lie about this. They always blame someone else for inflation. They never admit that they are the principal cause. And, you know, you go back back to uh, the 1700s, or, or I, I cover this uh, back in the 1600s, you know, Locke was talking about how artificially, interest, artificially low interest rates uh, increase land prices, increases rent. Mm. Um, so they understood this 300 years ago, more than 300 years ago. So, so why is it so befuddling to our, our central banks around the world? You know, they make statements like inflation came out of nowhere. <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute. You just printed billions of dollars due to a pandemic and, and it just came out of nowhere. I mean, come mm. on. Yeah. And, I, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Brad, even worse then they start blaming wages for the inflation. So they're in direct, you know, you know, the central economy is in direct competition with their laborers and they want to bring down those wages. And it's, it's, it's like, you know, this is such an insult. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, yeah, I have to, I have to think about, do you know the pizza lady? Which yes. Is, yeah. Yeah. I have to think That's about that because crazy it's, talk, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, yeah, I, I said this many times on a podcast before, but like I, I, I follow a lot in America. Obviously, I am in Europe, but you know, because America is the most important economy in the world, I look at America. I look at it from a distance. I, I you know, obviously with a different view than 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 Americans, but sometimes I think. And I, have, I, I hear the same crazy things in the EU, by the way, so it's not that different. But sometimes I hear very serious people with very, very, in very serious positions say things where I think, like, that's complete bullshit. And I'm not even a finance expert, and I know this is BS. So how, how does that work? Where does that come from? Is it really, is it also, like, for me, it's also a signal of how big, this fight or this challenge is, right? Like you're talking to your neighbor and he thinks inflation is good, maybe because the TV said so. Like, yeah. how would you describe this, this challenge? I, you know, the nuances of these conversations that I have with just everyday people is what I find most interesting. I, I like to ask them, you know, I, as an engineer, I've spent my whole life trying to make things more efficient and bring prices down. And, and so, you know, I say, OK, I'll be talking with a friend um, like I, I remember this conversation. I was at, at, at a Rainier Club. It's, it's an upper class place. Elderly people there were having a dinner party. You're supposed to have polite conversation. Right. So how do you have polite conversation about Bitcoin when when these people are their careers are based on, you know, the stock market and, and these. <laughs> so I, I said, you know, if if productivity and engineering and technology brings prices down, what, why are prices going up? Yes. You know, and, and I, I just kind of threw that out there and they kind of hemmed and hawed and then they didn't really understand. And, and I said, OK, is prices going up uh, good for people? <laughs> you know, and, and I come from I'm a Bitcoiner. And so I'm looking at it from this Adam Smith perspective. Hey, the wealth of nations is low cost commodities. That, that's your advantage over your competition. Right. Low yeah. cost commodities. And so you let technology run its course and it just keeps on bootstrapping up and up and up. And you just can't comprehend how, how abundant things will become. I mean, this is Adam Smith that published this, The Wealth of Nations, back in 1776. And so one of these, one of them was a financial advisor. And I said, so is prices going up good? And, and, and she said, yes. And I went to the next person. Yes. And you think prices going up is good? Yes. Th three in a row. <laughs> I'm just like, wow. You know? That we are just so indoctrinated with our fiat monetary system that, you know, housing prices going up, stock prices going up just because of money debasement. Everyone's indoctrinated into thinking this is good now. I think uh, if we talk about how big the challenge is, I think it's this. 
because it's very basic, right? Uh, people conflating price and value also. Um, I, I, my first topic when I talk about Bitcoin or want to talk about Bitcoin with people is exactly this, right? You know, why is it funny that a bread was 25 cents in 1960s and now it's four or five dollars or euros? Like, can you explain that to me? Do you think that is a, that is a good thing? Or, yeah, sh should the bread be free? Should we have free bread? Or should everyone have like little pills that they mix with water and then a bread pops out or whatever the invention could have been, right? And so... Um, this is obviously one of the things that you talk about in the book, right? You talk about deflationary trends and the, and the implication. You, the simplest rational argument is progress in technology um, results in lower cost of said technology or whatever their output is, right? You see that with mm -hmm. uh, first you had monks writing in books, then you had the printing press, you know, that's condensed energy, same as horses, trains and telegram uh you know satellites whatever like it's it's you, you you do even more with less energy over greater distance etc um so we have we have seen these examples they exist it's it's not a concept right uh, improved technology eventually democratizes a lot of stuff energy information and therefore you know we move forward as a civilization so we we know that is true um that I, I think is also the main topic that Jeff Booth talks about a lot. Yeah, and yeah. You, you mentioned I'm a huge this fan in, of Jeff. Yeah, likewise. So you mentioned this in the book, but also you mentioned something called deleveraging deflation. And what, like, like what, what are these concepts? So you have, you know, the, the deflationary well, I, I, I think I call technology. it booth deflation. I call yeah. it booth deflation because it's really technology yeah. that's driving that. Exactly. But, yeah. uh, but our fiat, you know, steals that productivity and centralizes it. And, and that's the problem. And I just, I, I want to reference, uh, you know, I mentioned John Locke later on. That was 1691. I'm just looking at my outline. And he was the one that was fighting against artificially low interest rates back in 1691. You know, wow. so he was, let's say, anti- Keynesian before Keynesian was even around. Yeah. But uh, no. And so, yeah, this, the question about digital transformation is deflationary. So everything should become more democratized and cheaper. But price is going up. What do people need to understand about that? Well, they need to understand that this is a root pro problem for all of our societal issues. When you see yeah. the, the growing number of homelessness that's out there, and it's happening in eight, every major city in the U.S., uh, you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, and all the major cities. It's because uh, it's because of this theft. It's because of debasement. It's because of housing prices are going up. Those who are marginalized can no longer afford it. They're become they're going homeless because of this. So if we really want to talk about these fundamental problems that are growing in society, we, we really need to really consider uh changing our monetary system. And that's why that's why I think zero tax Bitcoin is so fundamentally important for accelerating this transition from bad money to good money. And so how, how would that work? Zero tax Bitcoin? Um, I, I think uh, there's multiple ways. You know, Javier Millet down in Argentina is just saying, hey, all, all these monies can be used in Argentina. He's going to that policy. Uh, you have El Salvador which they went with Bitcoin legal tender. That's another way, uh, you know, and there's, and you could just address the tax code directly. So those are three different ways that we could, we could get there. We're going to get there because yeah. our numbers just simply keep growing. Yeah. And so if you would keep the example of the bread or I like the, in, uh, there's a video by Lynn Alden, uh, Broken Money from her book, but she, she made a video. I don't know if you saw that, like a 30 minute explainer. I did. Of, I didn't see the whole book. thing, but yeah, uh, yeah. wonderful. There, Very good. There, there was a great um, illustration or animation, I have to say, where they they portrayed like prices like a little blob <laughs> and mm -hmm. that was like on a on a downslope hill that was pushed down by technology, but it was like shot up with little bullets by, uh, you know, mo monetary inflation. So more, um, more units printed, deflation or, or sorry, devalue of the of the of the value, and therefore inflation of the prices. Right? You need more units. So, 
that is kind of like the battle that is that is happening. Well, if a bread is five dollars, I think it's clear which side is winning, uh, which I think is also a, a huge signal that we are very far away from what it should be, right? It's like we are going back in time. If the bread was 25 cents in the 1960s and now it's $5, it's like, you know, I make the joke that we're going back to the invention of bread or something. Like we are going back in time, which is wild. How does Bitcoin offer a solution to that battle that is that is going on? Well, we're, we're growing. It's becoming so our monetary system is growing increasingly inefficient because of the financialization, because of the third party, because of their grift, because of their graft. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the monetary system is growing increasingly inefficient, but that doesn't mean that it's going to implode for sure. It just means that, you know, the, the few are going to have all the assets and that the financial system in terms of efficiencies will be less efficient. So, yeah, we're moving towards less efficiency because of the centralization of our economy. Uh, you know, how do we transition to good money from bad money? Well, I don't know how it's going to play out. I know it's going to play out because you just can't put, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin is that genie. And, and so you, you, this actually brings up a, a, another point. One thing that we want is a, a standard measure of value, a standard measure yes. of value, right? Mm -hmm. I would say most Bitcoiners understand that. And then, uh, you know, if Ethereum Vitalik didn't understand that, he went on to all kinds of narratives, you know, oh, we're going to build a world computer and ICOs and DAOs and all kinds of decentralized ideas. But he never really understood this, this concept of, we want good money. We want to asymptotically grow towards this, this, let's call it, uh, you know, a, a standard measure of value. Yeah. And then just recently, a couple of years ago, he, he, he came back to this idea of, of, of having uh, good money. And he says, oh, we're going to reduce the supply of Ethereum so that we can increase the price of it more. And it's like, no, you're missing the point. We, we want a standard measure of value. We, we yeah. don't want everyone to, again, you're going from one extreme like to the other. It's like fiat again, right? It's, it's yeah, like fiat. You, you don't get yeah. it, Vitalik. You, you don't yeah. understand why, why Bitcoin was invented. Yeah. You don't understand the, the proposition and really how this is so extraordinarily valuable to humanity. Um, you know, you're just out there trying to make a buck and, yeah. uh, and you, you, you're destroying the, the original intent of Bitcoin. I think why uh, I, I call it the standard measurement for human productivity. Um, it is. You know, because human productivity is energy we expend in a certain amount of time, which is represented in um how do you say that like uh, a perceived value you know of a value exchange right so if i do something for you and you want what i do that is the value you're right you you see it as value and then we have an exchange where we settle the amount of units of whatever currency you know you pay me and that's then the abstract um of that value but i i think the standard measurement idea is very interesting right because when you have it a is. standard measurement of one meter which uh, the U.S. still doesn't adhere to, by the way. But that's that's another story, right? Yeah, with, uh, I, I, I want to. Yeah, I want to continue with your thread, but I want to make a, a point. When you can reduce the supply, as Ethereum has done, I mean, there's no different than that in a CDBC. There's no different between Ethereum and you know a, a, a fiat. When you start manipulating the supply like that, there is no difference. Yeah, or a quantitative and, tightening or whatever. It's the same. <laughs> Yeah, Ethereum CDBCs exactly the same thing now because yeah. they are manipulating the, the yeah. supply and they think it's ultra sound money. No, no, it it it's a scam. And uh, and so what we want to do as Bitcoiners, we want to move towards that that ideal. And and I I agree that it can be value, it can be energy, it can be a number of things. People use the word sometimes describing money attribute a money attribute as being fungible. Um, you can transfer it to different kinds of whatever. I mm -hmm. personally, when it comes to the word fungible, I've always struggled with that. And I think for me, the best synonym is probably liquidity. 
you know, mm-hmm. because that really, I, people understand that you can, you can buy and sell things very quickly. Yeah. That to me is, is, a be, I think that's a better word than fungible. Yeah. I was thinking about my thread. Oh yeah. So the, the standard measurement for a meter is, I don't know. I, I, I think like it's, it's, it's more practical than if we would talk about money, right? Because if we use different meters, <laughs> you know, different lengths mm-hmm. for, for, but we call it a meter and we build a house or a building and the building collapses, you know, it's, it's very obvious that it's uh, it's not a good construct in a sense. Right. But when it comes to, to money, that's, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a bigger idea, but it's also very hard because up until now, everything has been so abstracted away from us. So we, what we just said, right? Uh, you mentioned free market. If you combine that with my example, right? In a free market, you and I meet, I say, this is my offer. You say, you know, I say, this is my offer. I want a thousand units of whatever currency. You say, oh, I like it, but I want nine hundred. want to pay 900. I say, okay, fine. We shake hands. You know, that that is how it should work, I'd say. But if there's a third party that influences the value of the units that we use when you reward me, that that is not a free market. And if you even make that more international, if, if there's three people that do the exact same thing, that deliver the exact same value, right? One in Congo, one in the UK, and one in yes. you know, Germany based on the currency that they are rewarded with, it's actually valued on a different level, which doesn't make sense because if you go back to the essence, it's their energy expended in in X amount of time, which is the same for all people, right? So I think I I like to focus on that idea now. It's currently, I think, my main kind of like topic to to see if we can illustrate that for people, to make it like a practical thing. And we don't even have to talk about Bitcoin yet. Right. We don't. We, yeah, we don't that's right. Do that. this, hmm. this is a fundamental problem before Bitcoin even showed up. And so th- I, I think Bitcoiners kind of get carried away with with uh, what Bitcoin is and, and the value proposition that it represents. And they'll say things like one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. And, and to me, there's no value proposition in that. I mean, it's just circular logic. But the idea of of uh, the standard measurement of value, it's not there yet. But it is going in that direction because it is asymptotic ideal money. Yeah. Every four years, we're moving towards that. And so if you understand the long-term value proposition of Bitcoin, then I think you're on message. Otherwise, if you say, here we are, it's, it's now, uh, I, I think you're missing the, the principal value proposition, what Bitcoin really is. And this is something that was understood long time before uh, yeah. before Bitcoin was around. You, you know what? Um, you know, John Nash won the Nobel Prize for, uh, you, you know, you know that guy in the beautiful mind, right? John Nash, um, he was, he, he had 25 years of, of schizophrenic, uh, paranoid schizophrenic ill, and then he recovered and, and he continued his, his work in mathematics and, and, uh, and he won a Nobel Prize in economics for that. Back in 1947, 48, he went to one economics class and they were discussing international problems, negotiation. And one of the main things back then was these, you know, different standards of, for money. And so this was a, an idea that was happening, uh, you, you know, and, you know, Catalone uh, talks about it with the Catalone effect. I mean, the, these, these uh, economists, it, it, it's, it's actually a pretty simple problem and it's a recurring problem. And, and how, and what, what's interesting about John Nash is he, with about six axioms, he was able to transition this, this concept of, uh, let's call it the, the invisible hand that, that Adam uh, Smith talked about. You know, he talked about supply and demand and the invisible hand. And then John Nash comes along and replaces the invisible hand with this Nash equilibrium. And it's mathematically defined. So it's no, long, no longer invisible. Mm-hmm. It's actually mathematically defined. And that's what he won the Nobel Prize for. And he was addressing this age old problem of international negotiations when you don't have a common monetary system. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's also interesting that just fiat money itself is is a blip in the history of all the money, <laughs> right? And that's also something I think most people don't get taught, I want to say, right? We just talk about the word money and the, you know, the coins and the bills are synonym for money that is just the money. Um, why and uh, why do you think that is? Is that just plain simple to obscure the fact that, uh, you know, we are the recipients of the debasement of the money eventually, so we shouldn't think about it a lot. But also, how is that different in, in, in your school time? Did you ever learn about the what is money question? Well, that, that's, that's a big... Rather than trying to address that straight on, which I don't think you can because it's so big, let, let me give my personal history of how I kind of bumped into it. I remember I was over in the Middle East studying um, and I, I had a, a, an instructor named Nafez Nizal and he was a PhD, he wrote for Time Magazine. Uh, he, he was part of UCLA from time to time. He was actually part of the PLO at one time, Palestinian. Um, oh, forgot what PLO even stands for. Liberation but, uh, just, something. <laughs> yeah. Liberation organization. Yeah, I just lost interest in the Middle East because uh, it's endless. But um, but anyways, he was a great instructor. And one of the things, I took a current events course from him. And he, he uh, talked about how Oil is bad for nation states because it becomes so top heavy, whereas these other countries that don't have oil, their economies develop and they're more diverse and more stable. And these rich co countries with oil, they're corrupt. And there's many examples of their corruption and, and instability. And I was just sitting there thinking there, I was like 22 years old maybe at the time. And I, I was just thinking, wow, all that wealth is bad long-term. And then I kind of bumped into another concept later on called Dutch disease. It was invented by a magazine, The Economist in 1977. And more or less uh, the Netherlands, you know, they found some natural gas. It deplaced a lot of their economy. And then that natural gas just kind of was a bubble and, and they ran out of it and all their good economy that was stable and it, it had been displaced. So they went through a, you know, major doom, doom after that. So that's uh, that's the same situation we're in with fiat because we export U S treasuries. It's no different than, you know, the economy all being about oil or natural gas, like Dutch disease, it's the place it's displacing our economy, you know, engineering, uh, manufacturing, all of our low cost commodities, they are being displaced by our exporting of U.S. treasuries. It is Dutch disease. It is that same scenario where there's only one economy. There's only it, it has been centralized and it's very damaging to, you know, the wage earner, to the engineers, to the manufacturing base, to our low cost commodities. It all disappears. I mean, it, it, it transitions to other places in the world. So I have a really big thought and I want to check it with you. But if that if that is what they are doing, right, they're exporting the deva devaluation of the money through the treasuries also, right, and printing the money, they, they get cheap energy because everything is paid in the petrodollar. So there is a moment or, or, or a, a frame of time in which you profit from that heavily. But because all the incentives get screwed or, you know, they, they get flipped eventually, you know, you, you, what you just said is happening, right? Like all the manufacturing leaves, etc., all these things. And then you get to like the, like th then how you profit goes down the drain slowly because then you become more dependent on all these other countries that are slowly also more unhappy with the, devaluing money that you force them to use so how, how is this still a good idea you know it, it is not a good idea but yeah it's well, interesting let, is it, let me yeah. um let me address that with my history my evolution um you, you know i've always been kind of interested in macroeconomics just as a hobby right and uh, so i've like others we follow the fed 
and these, you know, the central bank and, and listen to their policies. And we talk about, oh, this is inflationary and this is deflationary. But I think after, you know, being in Bitcoin since 2017, I've, I've transitioned to, is that a centralizing function or is that a, uh, you know, or is that booth deflationary or is that yeah. a decentralizing function? I'm looking at things in a different light now and the central bank is just irrelevant. It, it doesn't yeah. matter to me anymore. Is that a centralizing function or a decentralizing function? And that's what I'm really interested in, in terms of, hey, let's, are we going to have a robust, uh, resilient economy in the future or aren't we? we? We don't have it right now because it's been overly centralized. Yeah. So basically you ended up with the conclusion centralization is bad. We should move away from that. And that is now your, uh, yeah, how do you call it? it yeah, your, I mean, your, you your look at the collapse the of the Soviet Union. Yeah, it's it's top heavy. It's unstable. I mean, you look at these wealthy, again, we can go down that same list. Look at these yeah. very oil rich company or countries, nation states, and they become corrupt and they become top heavy and they're unstable. Again, uh, dust disease, you know, uh, with the Netherlands discovered this natural gas and then it went away and their economy was gone too. It had mm. transitioned to other countries. And, and that's exactly what all this money printing is doing to the United States is it's, dis it's displacing our, our economy to, it is dust disease. It is, yeah. it is displacing our economy to other countries. And so now we see the U S tax receipts are declining. Their expenditures are going up. Their debt interest payments are higher than what they're spending on uh, with regards to def defense um, uh, spendings, which I think is the first time ever uh, in, in, in history. So when the U.S. produces more debt than people are willing to buy, right? Those are the treasury auctions that we see that are worse by uh, <laughs> by each event i'd say uh you argue that we might be at the end of what is called the debt cycle uh, or the debt spiral what what will happen when we do i i think okay we are at the end but you know what what does that mean what is the end okay how do we define that yeah i i think uh what i mean by the end is in terms of our competition, somebody just is, is going to simply outperform the United States. Uh, that that could be one definition of the end. And you look at the the world right now; it's like, oh, well, that's you know, that's down the road. Um, there's certainly when 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 you're exposed in terms of that kinds of kind of weakness, it certainly increases the risk of war. As you can, we're seeing more regional conflicts conflicts happening. So, yeah, I, I'm one to believe that these regional conflicts are going to increase real risk in ta Taiwan. I might, might be a minority vo voice on that, but uh, I think that there's there's uh, there's there's going to be a growing number of of conflicts. But keep in mind that, you know, people, nobody buying U.S. treasuries, you know, don't go there because. Our government can just simply print more money and buy those bonds back. I mean, this is what the Bank of Japan has been doing. And yeah, you've seen the, the USD to, to yen, you know, the yen just keeps getting weaker and weaker and they'll just dump a bunch of U US treasuries and buy back uh, those, that yen and, and, and their bonds. And it's, it, it delays, it kicks that debt can down the road and yeah. they can do that for a long time. It's not gonna implode like that, okay? I could be wrong. But I think it's just going to continue to degrade the efficiency of our economy. Things are going to continue to get more expensive. Our real wages are not going to increase. Our nominal wages will increase. Uh, it's just going to get more and more difficult. So when, when do we hit, hit the end? Um, I think that could be a, a long time now, time from now where we go through a revolutionary change with our monetary system uh, where the U.S. dollar collapsed. I don't think that's going to happen. I personally think this is this is where I think where we're going to go. There's there's really going to be no end. There's going to be a transition to good money, and mm -hmm. Bitcoin. The transition to Bitcoin, I think, is the most likely outcome in terms of the debt spiral. Because because when when Bitcoin becomes a, a reserve asset, all that four hundred trillion dollar world debt, poof, it's gone. 
it implodes. So yeah, I'm saying implode again, but but yeah, it can go down rapidly. But you know, let's face it, fiat never really dies. It just keeps debasing a thousand mm -hmm. times. Yeah. Over and over again. I think that brings me to another point that I that is a bit bit more difficult than what we first talked about, I think. But if banks or if countries can just print their own money and roll over their debt, you know, by buying their own treasuries with newly created money and kicking that can down the road. Why, why do nations need loans in the first place? This entire system of, of countries buying each other's debt. Yeah. Like, why, I, I why is that, that needed? I love that concept that you just brought up. Yes. But, but why yeah. is it needed? Why, why do we believe in that or something? Why, what, yeah. It makes no well, sense. I don't get here's it. Here's my here's my angle on that. Fiat, dirty dirty money. You know, fiat is fiat, and you can call it classical fiat, where you roll the debt and you expand the monetary units, and that's classical fiat. Or yeah. you could do this modern monetary theory, which would be modern fiat, where you just go out and print it. Really, there's no difference. But but it, what I don't get is then it, this is to a disadvantage of your citizens eventually, because they are forced to use your currency because they are citizens of your country. So yeah. by, I don't know, in some way, keeping your treasuries alive, I don't know, let's call it like that, you are killing your citizens, killing quote unquote, right? We like, are. Uh, yeah. And, and I think a sudden transition would you know, for fixed income, it's, it would hurt a lot of people, right? So, so mm -hmm. really, we need an evolutionary approach, and and Bitcoin is that evolutionary approach. Yeah, way we again, way we way we can accelerate that is we, we need to we have to move towards legalization or do like Mille Javier is doing in Argentina. Mille Har Javier Javier I, I, Javier I can't say it right. Javier, Javier Mille. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what he's doing, make you know, all money, use what money you want. Or I, anything I, is money, he said, right? I, I yeah, yeah. I I personally I'm very partial towards uh, legalizing Bitcoin, making it legal tender. And and I know some of my libertarians say, hey, you know, people should be able to use whatever they want. And I, I'm thinking, well, what about these CBDCs? You know, I, I don't want them to be legal tender. I, I don't I don't want this, you know, surveillance money floating around the United States. I don't want that. But you well, know, that's that's a yeah. small debate. Well, just the principle of, it's so funny because I heard myself again say like uh, currency that we're forced to use. This is only something I learned like, I don't know, in the past three years. And for some people, it sounds way too harsh, but there is no, the currency is forced upon you. It's not an organic thing. It's not, an, you know, it's some, not something that grew organically. So how are you ever, or when are you ever able to judge if the money you know, or the currency that you're forced to use is a political currency. Some people call it, which I also like, you know, that you're forced to use is actually working for you, right? Like there, there is no moment of that because when you're a child, you get some coins and there are some bills, you go to the grocery store, you get something, you know, Oh, okay. This is what we do or something. And then from there on, th that is what money is. Yeah, it, it's forced on us and it's surveillance money. And uh, I, I'm a very strong privacy advocate. So, you know, whether money is good or bad, it's always relative between this and that. And you can compare a money, you know, like the Italian lira compared to the EU. Um, you know, clearly the, the euro is better than what the Italians had as, as a lira, right? Mm. Uh, so what is good money? What is bad money in that situation? I would say clearly the, the euro is, is good. Yeah. but. If you compare the euro compared to a commodity-based monetary system, euro is bad money. You know, it, it is surveillance money, it is fiat, and it is theft. So it's always a, a relative. Um, well, and the euro is better for the Italians than for the Dutch. So there's even yeah. a difference within that uh, within that area. So yeah. then, if if we look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is going through its its monetization phase, which basically means people are figuring out what this is worth how it can be valuable, how it can be used, you know, it's, it's, it's entering, let's call it the market. Could you elaborate on the path that you, you talk about in the book that, that 
is the monetization path? Like what are the steps that, that we go through? It, it starts with store yeah. of wealth, right? That's right. Store of wealth. And, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple attributes to store of wealth. And some of those attributes are, are, can be emergent, such as liquidity. Liquidity isn't just, boom, there it is. But it, it's something that, uh, you know, it's kind of like asymptotic ideal money or something that emerges. Uh, it, it, it comes with time. Uh, so store of wealth, uh, you know, needs divisibility. It needs that liquidity. So it's, it keeps on, you, you want it, to, you don't want it to, to base. That's number one. And uh, you don't want it manipulated like ETH. Uh, you, you want it decentralized, which brings that stability. So the fact that you can't change the monetary policy is one of the most important things for creating a store of wealth that is trustworthy. And, uh, you know, above all, Bitcoin is the most decentralized commodity-based monetary system that has ever been created. Uh, nothing comes close to Bitcoin in terms of its decentralized monetary system and its network effect. So, so Bitcoin is becoming increasingly a store of wealth because its liquidity keeps improving. And so the, the more expensive it becomes, the more valuable it becomes. You know, it's worth more than one trillion. When it becomes 10 trillion, it's gonna be even more liquid. And so there's a more likelihood that you'll start buying oil with Bitcoin instead of US dollars. And uh, you know we, we know the petrodollar is already going away. But the next step I really talk about is medium of exchange and Bitcoin is far superior in terms of medium exchange, if you're moving like a billion dollars from New York to London, you know, Bitcoin, they can do that for that transaction fee is three and it, th th maybe three dollars. And the finality is, you know, 30 minutes, perhaps, maybe longer. If, if, if yeah. it's, you know, I, I tweeted busy. about this yesterday. I think it's interesting that a lot of people are like, oh, Bitcoin is so slow, blah, blah, blah. But uh, let's see. I, I was looking for my tweet, but... Uh, Oh, yeah. I said, at the scale of world finance, a full settlement on the most secure monetary network to ever exist in 60 minutes is fast enough. Like it, like you said, if you want to move a billion plus between a country or, yeah, New York and London, whatever, there's nothing yeah. like it. There, nothing there, is like no, it. There, there is nothing to compare it to, you know. And if, right. do you, would you want to do it faster? Would you want to move a billion in three seconds? You know, probably not, <laughs> you know, so I think it's interesting about when you talk about uh, um, the, the speed also, you know, like the, a lot of these crypto projects take the speed part or the technology of speed and say like, oh, I'm going to improve this, you know, this is better because it's faster, but they missed the entire point, I'd say, of, <laughs> you know, the entire in, in, entire trilemma of Bitcoin when also, you know, you talked about the decentralization, security, and speed. That's the that's the trilemma of it. Yeah, and then I also transition to the next section, which which is medium of exchange for small transactions. And I was down in El Salvador for uh, Bitcoin Legalization Day, and I was buying coffee, you know, and the, the transaction on a Lightning Network would happen in less than two seconds, and. You know, if I, I was using a custodial wallet at that time, I was using Strike and it cost me a penny for the transaction. And if you if you go non-custodial, it's like one five hundredth of that, you know, of a penny. It, yeah. It's extremely cheap. And and this people say, oh, Lightning Network will have some problems and here and there. Well, they're getting better. And, and who cares about Lightning Network only? There are many, many second layers. ETFs are is a second layer where you can do transactions just by buying and selling ETFs. Yeah. And so in the future, we're gonna have dozens of second layers uh, around the world. Um, so that's that too is emerging. And then the third thing I really get into is unit of exchange. And some people say, oh, it'll never get there. It's gonna get there. Uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, the superior attributes of Bitcoin in terms of store of wealth, medium of exchange for large and small transactions uh, is going to lead to asymptotic ideal money. And it's just a matter of time and it will take time. It's, it's, it's evolutionary. It's not going to be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. It's evolutionary. And there will be, come a time when they start selling oil in Bitcoin. 
So what challenges or obstacles do you see with regards to adoption before we get to that point, you know, uh, I, I buying think, or selling commodities with Bitcoin? I think the biggest um, problem we have with Bitcoin emerging as, as uh, you know, a, a standard measurement of value is really the, the fiat banks. They know it's there. They know what it is. And they know it's it's an exit, and they know that if there is an exit, it will be used, and so they're very interested in slowing the adoption of Bitcoin. And yeah. and I think a perfect example of that is you know it took us more than ten years to get an ETF, and then almost immediately you know they, the SEC gets a phone call or whatever happened in the background, and they just say oh. You know, Ethereum is going to get an ETF too, and it's a commodity. It's not a commodity. The no. SEC just threw out the Howey test altogether. You know, there are centralized decisions for profit making in Bitcoin. I mean, excuse me, in, in Ethereum with pre-mining and changing monetary policy. You know, I mean, these examples clearly identify it as not a commodity, and it should be a, a registered security. So I think the the thing that's holding back. Bitcoin right now is those who want to protect these um, fiat banks, uh, they're obfuscating the power of Bitcoin just by saying, let's bring in all this crypto garbage and, and just kind of obscure what the true message is of Bitcoin. And that is we're, 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 going, we're moving towards zero inflation. Yeah. N now, now that you mentioned this, I think like, isn't this also a signal of, the, of the fact we're waiting absolutely like that they are that they yeah. are actively you know moving against it yeah absolutely it, it's it, it was an act of desperation um to just you know open up the doors and just let all that crypto start coming in and you yeah. know i mean solana's they're going to get an etf and all this other stuff is and they're just they're just going to be eating at each other in terms of all these narratives Bitcoin's narrative is pretty simple, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's ideal. I mean, it's, it's asymptotic ideal money. It's sound money. It's, it's digital gold. It's pretty simple. Yeah. And so the, the book is called Apex Environmental Solution. How does Bitcoin eventually provide that? What, what are the sustainable benefits? Well, I talk about first order, second order, and, and third order effect. And, um, and so the first order effect of Bitcoin is your real wages, when we transition to a commodity-based monetary system where we don't have fiat, you know, and, and, natural, and there's, there's natural interest rates out there. It's not usury, it's not fiat, it's right in the middle. And we're talking about free market. And when, when you have that situation, when central banks can no longer debase your, your money, when they can no longer debase your wages, the first order effect is your real wages is, is going to go up. And, uh, and also the prices of the things that you want is going to go down instead of them artificially nominally bringing up these prices by increasing the number of units, you know. So that's the first order effect. I think that the second order effect of, of Bitcoin is it will transition, I mean, as, as the human mind starts to, let's say, synchronize with Bitcoin, they will naturally understand that there's a different set of incentives now. They can save, they can search, uh, conserve, and they're gonna be rewarded. Whereas right now we can't, we're constantly being incentivized to consume, to even hyper-consume. And so that's the second order yeah. effect of Bitcoin is we will transition the, in the incentive from saving from hyperconsumption to savings and conservation. So that's the second thing. And I bring up a, a, another the third order effect, and this is probably a little more controversial, but I, I really the third order effect, you're going to see the end of the GDP fertility wards. Um, and, and what I mean by that is fiat banks need growth. And one way they do that is they subsidize these population growth. They, they have to have population growth so they, they can continue to expand the monetary units. Yeah. And, and Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin doesn't need that. 
And so that's the big difference is that when those subsidies go away for all these, you know, all, what I call the GDP fertility wars, um, there's that, that, that incentive to do that. It just Bitcoin doesn't care. It doesn't matter anymore. And so those people who are saving and, and conserving, they're going to get the rewards. And it's not going to be this political money that's subsidizing these other very, let's say, expensive behaviors. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because this, I would add this to, you know, there were a few years of, you know, first initial years of fiat where there was growth and prosperity and then things went faster, et cetera. But now it's on the decline because all the productivity is outsourced. But also when you talk about fertility wars, like that fertility, is, you know, it's uh, the, the birth rates are going down because mm -hmm. people, you know, are not looking forward to the future because the current, you know, system is so flawed. They, they're not profiting from it, right? They're not getting ahead in life or they cannot do what's been told to them that they could do, right? Build a family, get a house and, you know, all the, all the, all these things. It, just in this short conversation, there's al already two huge pointers that would point out that fiat money eventually is just a really bad idea, right? It's a, it, but, it's a bad idea. Yeah, but but the citizens are stuck, and 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 the people in charge want to protect the system. So now I think uh, like are we at the end of this spiral but it could still take a while maybe until mm -hmm. the people in charge are gone but it, it's not really it doesn't matter which person is in charge you know in that system the system is kind of designed to keep, to keep itself alive but also therefore I'd say Bitcoin is that lifeboat that other paradigm right what Jeff Booth talks about it's just an entirely different thing we cannot compare it we don't have to compare it to the current paradigm it's just an a literal exit it's just you know now that, now that i'm talking i think about one of my biggest moments with bitcoin is when i realized i should move my economic energy from the fiat system to the bitcoin system and then then i'm good and that's when i when i realized that i started moving so i, I also don't see it as buying bitcoin i literally literally see it as I'm just moving economic energy to this this other system uh, and while I still can, I want to say, you know, because they will they will bar the exits. Um, but I only think that will accelerate it, right? That's kind of like a Streisand effect. Uh, if you don't want yes. people to, to do it, they're going to do it and they're going to be very angry um, yes. when, when they're not able to do it. And And you see people become more aware of this. Right, the the fact yeah. that there is no money in the bank, there is no spoon, like they say in the Matrix. Right, uh, it's uh, it, yeah, that's real. It's not a concept. Yeah, and let me bring up one more topic on this third order effect. And and keep in mind, everyone brings their baggage to Bitcoin. Okay, this is my baggage. All right, this is not let's say mainstream Bitcoin stuff. But yeah. I'm a conservationist, and and in terms of looking at that third order effect of what what I call you know ending the GDP fertility wars. I, I wrote it uh, metaphorically also. I mean, I know um, like Malthus got it wrong, you know, the Malthusians, right? Um, this, I, I call it Malthusian beer and Solstinian wine. Solstin is my last name, right? So Malthus got it wrong because he didn't understand the power of technology and how you can make food cheaper and cheaper and cheaper thanks to technology. And because of this industrial revolution because of technology revolution and, and, you know, this, let's call it AI revolution. I mean, it, intelligence is just getting more and more powerful and that is technology. So Malthus had it wrong and he didn't understand that food was going to get a lot cheaper and it would, technology would grow faster than the population. And so here we went from what, 1804, 1 billion people. And then to, to, to today, 8 billion people. I mean, a little over 200 years and we've gone up by a factor of eight. I mean, we are expanding rapidly. And so I, I'm, I'm of the opinion, opinion that our world is grossly overpopulated. Um, you know, if there was only a billion people and we had the same technology, you know, imagine the, the ratio to resources, you know, in terms of a zero sum way of looking at things. But let me continue. 
about the Celestinian wine theory. Beer dies because it runs out of food, right? I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the yeast actually hibernates because it runs out of food. With wine, the yeast dies in its own waste. So that's the key difference. I don't think, I don't, I don't think Malthusian theory, theory is relevant. It's not working. I mean, it's, it's a dead theory. But I do believe in what I termed or what I wrote as Solstinian wine theory. And if we are dependent on a fiat monetary system where we have to have population growth just so that we can expand the monetary units, no. then we're going to end up dying in our own waste because we live on a finite planet. We cannot grow yes. forever. And, and you, can, you already see that with forever chem chemicals. And, yeah. and you know, I, I know people will disagree with me on this, but, you know, it's just, it's, let's well, call I it my, think, my I, I think, yeah, I think it's an interesting thought in a sense that my first thought would be we are growing based on the wrong, fueled by the wrong incentives, as, as, you, as, as you alluded to, right? Like to... To keep a system alive that benefits a few people, we have to have a lot of people. But as as we alluded to with two other points of eventually, you know, the consequences of a fiat money system are, are very bad. This is this is another one, by the way, right? Uh, the, mm -hmm. the fact that you have to have population growth to to keep the scam alive is is well, maybe you know, that's a very wild thought, I would say. But on the other side, what if uh, technology was actually rewarded properly, therefore deflationary, and therefore we could actually have more people because we would appreciate life more or have more time and space to uh, you know, focus on, I think, what inherently is our goal, which is reproduction, right? So that would have perhaps yeah. the same eight or 10 million people, but then with totally different incentives and and possibilities too. Well, I, I would say, you know, that people have different opinions on that. And, and, and that's why I couch it as this is a third order effect. Our, mm. our first order effect, getting back to, you know, what's fundamental about Bitcoin is the first order effect is your real, real wages are going to go up and the prices of things that you want are going to go down. And yeah. that's what we all agree on as Bitcoiners. So let's talk about that. Let's just keep the narrative simple. Um, that's the truth. And yeah, I, 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 lo I love that you have a third order effect because I think it, th th this is why it's so big because eventually it, it, it does make sense that these things follow each other, right? Because, well, if your wage goes up, basically I think in simpler terms is you get a more fair reward for the value that you deliver. Therefore, you have more options to, to spend that, those rewards you know, in, in your life, in whatever way you would want. But also because everything gets cheaper, you know, we move to, well, that's what Jeff Booth says, right? We move to this, this world of abundance, which eventually, and, and, and so maybe it's closer to, to what I just also said, like maybe that would even drive us to, to become more productive because we are more free. We can, you know, experiment more, uh, be less confined yeah. to whatever shitty, stupid job people have right now, right? And actually, absolutely. To that the last world. statement you meant when you have your own free time, you're going to work on things that are most productive. 100%. So I, 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 we're not going to yeah. be lazy, I think. We're not going to work on some pushy, pushing paper nonsense that a lot of us have to do from time to time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, looking at the time and thinking about what I still want to ask you. So, um yeah so if, if we want to move there right and we we've talked about governments trying to keep their own system in place you know whatever individual is sitting in in the seats but if there are any what are some practical steps a government can take to transition from from this fiat based system to a, a bitcoin based system because my thought is but please correct me that there has to be some sort of, you know, you mentioned implosion, but there has to be some sort of, yeah, I don't know how to call it. Uh, uh, someone has to settle the check somewhere in some way, right? So we cannot, we cannot be like, you know, we adopt Bitcoin and the only way is up. There is, there, there is an inevitable dip in, I don't know if yeah. that's GDP or productivity or whatever. How do you see that? Well, I, I see really time as being the main thing. These, these, these emerging attributes take time. 
it, it, it's it's emergent. Um, we, you know, you look at these people that tried to rush things in the past. A lot of these guys are in trouble. You know, I mean, like Roger Ver and and uh, it's it's really not about let's 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 get it done faster. Let's uh, let's understand that we live during a great time. Uh, this is going to be one of the the greatest evolutions in in human history, and we can look back on, on human history and see those people who tried to stop. Uh, you know these natural consequences. They ended up in trouble in prison or or. Um, yeah. You know, like one thing I wrote about uh, that I want to bring up just because it, it was so interesting to me when I was talking about the the spectrum trichotomy, and I, 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 I spent like 70 pages on that, just going through a 300 year history. And of course, I covered uh, John Locke, but I also talked about this John Law guy who, who showed up in around 1715. Um, you know, Louis the 14th died. They're massively in debt. They'd been through like five wars. And, uh, and so he shows up and says, look, I know how to fix this. And that was the first time the central bank got set up um, and they started issuing uh, paper money and paper other things and commingling funds. And, uh, you know, it was only, what, 17, 23 years later, everything imploded. And it, it, wow. Some people call it the Mississippi bubble because he was using real estate in America as collateral. And then inflating that and talking that up and saying, hey, this is worth a lot. No different than what FTX did, you know, the, the crypto guy, SBF guy. No different. Same thing. And it's the same thing that central banks do. You know, they're, they're always yeah, but just on a different scale. right? Yeah, yeah they're manipulating. They're manipulating supply and demand of these units. Uh, no different than Ethereum. Uh, so so FTX imploded uh, this John Law. Uh, you know, he his central bank, he was run out of uh, out of France. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's the same history repeating over and over again. Sometimes it really does implode and it, it's a sudden, OK, it's gone mm. and, and we might get there. Uh, I think Bank of Japan and, and the, you know, Jap and those bonds will be happen a long time before that happens to U.S. Treasuries. So let's let's wait and see, and we'll find out. Yeah, yeah, I love I love that you also mentioned before. Like it, it takes time, right? It's slow. I think well, maybe it's a symptom of the fiat money world, but and, and modern technology. But people are very impatient. Um, you know, it has to happen tomorrow. Uh, we should make a new technology that is faster. You know, Bitcoin is. Uh, is like uh, what did they say? Like Bitcoin is like Yahoo and stuff. Like people want to go way faster because, well, or they they see something. I think as we see what Bitcoin could bring to the world, right? Or they think it can already be done better. But reality is that most people have zero understanding of what Bitcoin is still, yeah. and we are super early, right? So it is. It is a long game. It, it's 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 a slowly permeating, you know, thing that is that is taking over the world. But you know, the cat's out of the bag, as you said. Like it's unstoppable. If this moves as the mind virus that it is across the world, how do you see the role of traditional banks changing as as Bitcoin becomes more more integrated? Because well, they they are not in one bed with governments, I'd say, especially not on like all the CBDC uh, stuff. Like it's uh, they, they are not joined forces all the time. Well, let, let me make a comment about what you said about things needing to be faster. Um, I agree with you. It, it doesn't have to be faster. It's perfect the way it is. When people are bringing that argument up, they don't understand the long history of layered money. It's just a ledger. They just need to sync up the ledgers. It's, it's, it's that easy. So it's not a big deal. Um, but but uh, on this other topic of where do you think the banks are going to go? Um, I think that they are going to, banks are going to implode. And what I mean by that is, let me, let me put this in context. Um, you know, when I was young, uh, I was thinking probably the most powerful lobby in the United States is probably the Israeli lobby. You know, uh, we give them like $3 billion, $3.1 billion a year. And for what? And, and they were very, and they would, you know, stop funding the political person that didn't support their legislation. And then later on, you know, I'd hear people talk about how oil is the most powerful lobby 
in the United States. And I don't think the Israeli lobby or the oil lobby is the most powerful lobby. I, I think the banking lobby is the most powerful. I mean, they, they fund these politicians. And so what do I think is going to happen to the banks? That, that fake money, or I shouldn't say fake money, I should say bad money because it's all relative. Uh, you're going to see the influences of the banks go away. And right now they get what they want and they do it. In, they, they aren't doing it in public. And I'm talking about the IMF. I'm talk, talking about World Bank. I'm talking about the BIS, um, JP Morgan, um, Bank of America, all of these SIBs, significantly important banks. They are very powerful and they have huge influence over U.S. senators and U.S. House of Representatives. So, yeah, their influence is going to perhaps implode as we evolve towards good money. Yeah, interesting. I think uh, I, I think you have the same as in. Uh, sometimes I call Bitcoin entertaining now, like we see it. Um, we have to accept that it will take time, but along the way, it's entertaining, like it's intellectually entertaining or, or inspiring to see, you know, does it really play out like this? And I agree with, with what you said before, like the fact that we are living in this moment in time is is very, very interesting, right? Like there, it, it is, I think, a rough time with lots of, lots of insecurity, but I think people that, that, that were like uh, grownups in the 70s would probably say the same. You know, so, uh, you know, to each generation, their their own, you know, timeline of, of significant events in the world. But when it comes to changing the money of the world and, you know, aligning incentives from from very perverse ones to very positive ones, I think is, is just super interesting um, to follow. And uh, I think we have to accept that it will take uh, long amount of time, but perhaps that's also the lesson that uh, Bitcoin shows us that we, you know, if once you have that, you know, low time preference, as Safety Namu says, right, that uh, that that also frees your mind. At least that's that's what I've experienced. Yeah, it does, and honestly, I, I feel more free not being obsessed with Bitcoin. You know, I, I I'm starting to enjoy the nuances of of small talk with friends and and, and family and strangers. And I think that, that the fact that that's interesting to me now is it's almost like an escape from my obsession, you know, mm -hmm. since 2017. So I, I'm really enjoying the, the, the more subtle conversations on, on really listening to people to see where they are at in their understanding of, you know, of a commodity based monetary system, which is pretty close to zero typically. And yeah. the last the last sentence I write, write in my book, uh, the, the big takeaway that I really wanted people to understand is that I, I wrote, you know, Bitcoin is not crypto. Bitcoin is a commodity. And, and when you understand that, then you can really start talking about these nuances and subtle conversations and, and commodity-based monetary systems in, a, yeah. in comparison to what we currently have. And so now, you know, that I think that uh, the, the powers that be behind this bad money, uh, they, want to off, they want to obfuscate that one message. Yeah. All right. I want to ask you my last question and I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Wow. Um, I would say I just, I strive to live kind of a simple minimalistic life. Like I have a general rule. If I haven't used it in two years, I get rid of it. You know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a minimalist. I just try to, I, I live a simple life. So I'm, yeah, it's my core belief uh, for my personal lifestyle. I, I'm a, I'm a minimalist, you know, it, 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 this will be another half hour discussion, but I'll, I'll, I'll just stop right there. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. I love that. I, uh, I, I am not that much of a minimalist in, in that sense, but I have the same rule when I'm cleaning. I think about this, this, uh, have I thought about this in the past two years? <laughs> and if the answer is no, then. You know, it's gone. But uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. And, and thanks so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. I will Thank make you, sure Brian. to uh, 
to link to your social profile and the book so people can check that out and follow you. Yeah, if you go to Solston, solston.com, it has the links to Amazon for the... I, I just want to recommend that the audio book, it's like 11 hours. I, I wrote this book with the intent of going on a long road trip and just listening to an audio book. And so it's very audio book centric. Um, so, you know, you can get the print, you can get the, the ebook, but I'd recommend the audio book. Awesome. Um, thanks again. And... Uh, We'll stay in touch. Cheers. All right. Thank you, Brian. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.